Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about drywall and some repair tips. All right, so I think a good place to start is, what is drywall? Okay. So companies take the mineral gypsum and they mix it with some additives and water and they make this paste. Mm -hmm. Then they spread it out on sheets of paper. They take another sheet of paper, put it on the other side of it, and then they heat this, they bake it. And primarily they're building 4x8, 4x10, and 4x12 sheets of this. Mm -hmm. So you can use it on walls and ceilings. And that's it. It's pretty straightforward. How thick is it? So the most common, they have a bunch of different sizes. Probably the most common in most homeowners' homes is going to be half inch. <laughs> homeowners so, home. I mean, you think of a wall and you're like, oh, these sturdy walls. <laughs> right. And it's, it's nothing, right? It is crazy. Put your fist right through it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you're so strong. Yeah, you want a half inch. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the old homes, like we used to buy all these old houses in Chicago, 80, 100-year-old houses, and they were the old plaster and lath. Mm -hmm. So they had these thin strips of wood that were almost butted up. There's a little bit of space in between the lath, and then they would take plaster and they would put it out over this lath, and it would ooze through the pieces of wood, and it would bind them all together, and then this plaster got hard as a rock. Mm -hmm. And they would usually put about three coats of this on. So they put one skim coat, let that dry, and just kind of hold it all together. And then they would come back with a second and third coat. And these guys were masters. When we first started uh, doing some of our remodeling, we saw a couple of the old timers working in a few of these foreclosures we bought. We would go in, we'd be bidding against other guys. And when we first started learning, we would go back and watch some of the other rehabbers mm -hmm. just to see what they were doing. A couple of them had beautiful craftsmen who went in and actually replastered some of these old homes and just I mean, the job was beautiful, but you talk about a solid house. Right, yeah. And you hit one of these walls, and there's no sound. <laughs> you know, you hit a drywall, and there's that, that yeah. hollow thud underneath it. But uh, drywall was a huge advance, though, in making homes, making homes quicker. In 1916, U.S. Gypsum, the company, mm -hmm. so USG, whenever you see that, that's right, this yeah. company that started drywall in 1916. And it really didn't take off at first because everyone, like you, you know, you think this is a cheap way right, to make yeah. a house. But then in World War II, the labor force, so many guys were either in the war or focused on building stuff for the war mm -hmm. that, that the, the trade, the laborers, really weren't around to build these homes. There was a need for homes, and they found that by using this drywall, so they said, okay, fine, we'll try some mm -hmm. homes using this uh, new product. And they found that they could build a home in a tenth of the time. Wow. Which is shocking. And it saved a, a ton of money. So they saved a lot of money, mm -hmm. It, you know, a tenth of the time, and then it just caught on. And once they started using it, you know, they never went back because it is so labor intensive to put all these strips of wood. So you've got your, you know, like on a wall, you'd have those two by four studs. You'd have all these little pieces of wood that you would right. nail up, and then you'd have to go through this, this process of putting plaster. So are there different types or grades of drywall? So you've got your basic drywall, and if you're doing repairs in your house, most homes are going to have half inch, but you'll, you know, if you're going to cut out a section, take a look, you can measure it and see, but you've got a standard drywall, then there's fire resistant, we had a couple commercial properties that we worked on, and we had to have fire mm -hmm. resistant drywall for repairs we made. There's moisture resistant, some guys call it green board, because it's a light, the paper, uh, right. that's covering the gypsum is a light green color so it's water resistant you'd use in bathrooms sometimes guys will use it in kitchens you've got sound resistant which is uh, nice for especially these new rooms we're building for home theaters and then for some of these old homes or if you've got you know some of the mansions they use a blue board so it's designed for plaster but rather than putting those first couple of coats on, it's a it's a heavy duty designed wallboard specifically for being topped with plaster. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So those are those are probably the most common types of drywall you'd see. You want to start covering drywall repair projects then? Sounds good. So fixing drywall is a great project for any homeowner and very quickly you can become very good at fixing nail pops, cracks, settling cracks and any small holes that you get in your walls mm -hmm. and it just takes a, a little bit of practice in fact uh, if you go to our YouTube channel fix it home improvement channel on YouTube and if you look under our playlists 
we have one titled How to Fix Drywall. And we've got a handful of videos that really show some really nice basic repair tips. We have a lot of videos. So I've yeah. recorded a lot of videos. <laughs> I make my sister watch all the videos. And, uh, she... I love it. <laughs> so she's a pro now? Yes, yeah, she knows. she's very confident <laughs> in the fact that she'll be able to handle any drywall project that comes her way. That's great. So probably in older homes, one of the most common problems are nail pops. So in older homes, they weren't using screws. They were using drywall nails. And over time, home settles, vibrations, trucks, streets in front of your house. These nails slowly loosen, work their way out, and you'll have this little bump mm -hmm. in your drywall. And they're very easy to handle. You would use a wide-headed hammer or a drywall hammer. And drywall hammers are unique. They have a, a very interesting wide head that's beveled so it keeps you from tearing the paper on the drywall. We don't want to tear the paper on the face of it because then you lose all the strength. So you're going to take this hammer, you're going to just dimple it so there's an indentation. And then I always use on repairs like this a very lightweight joint compound or lightweight spackle. Mm -hmm. It dries very quickly, it doesn't shrink, and it's very easy to cover this hole. So what you would want is a drywall blade, and the minimum drywall blade that every homeowner should have is a six inch blade for doing all the basic repairs. Doesn't matter if it's plastic or Plastic metal. or metal. I like the metal. It has a little bit of flex, and you can use it to scrape. It, it gives you a little more control over the compound, so I would prefer a metal blade. And you can buy an inexpensive one. They do a, as good a job as an expensive drywall knife. And you're just going to force it into this little indentation that you created with your hammer. And you're going to leave no excess on the surrounding drywall, so you're wiping it smooth. And you can make several passes in a couple of different directions so that you've just filled this indent. There's no excess, and just let it dry for a couple of hours. And depending on the spackle or the lightweight compound that you use, read on the side. Some of them will dry in as quickly as 20 minutes. Some will take one to two hours. Once it's fully dry, then you can hit this. You're going to, in most repairs, what we want to do is we want to take a damp sponge and we're just going to wring out most of the water, hit it with a damp sponge to get any little raised parts knocked down. We don't want to sand for the most part mm -hmm. until the very last time we, we coat it or if we, we, if we have to at all. If we can go without sanding, because this stuff just becomes just a mess. It gets to a fine dust. You breathe and it's everywhere. It gets everywhere. So if we use a, a good quality damp sponge just to hit it and smooth it, it does an excellent job. And so you put your first coat on, you'll hit it with a damp sponge, get it really smooth, then take a second thin coat, and you're just filling any imperfections. You're pulling it tight so there's, there's no excess on the surrounding drywall, mm -hmm. and that's all there is to it. So very easy repair. Now, if you have an area that has more than just a couple of nail pops, you're going to want to secure that whole panel. So if you have a bunch of nail pops, what you're going to do is you're going to use a stud finder, you're going to find the studs, and then you're going to take drywall screws, and an inch or two above and an inch or two below those nail pops, we're going to secure it with screws. You're going to slightly indent. You want a little dimple. Again, you don't want to tear the face paper. And then you're going to take a hammer, you're going to dimple in those nail pops, and then you'll cover the screw heads and you'll cover those divots. The, the, kind of the same approach we used before, but this way we're securing that panel. So if there's one or two here and there, you know, it's a problem with the nail, but if we have a large section, we definitely want to secure that panel of drywall. Since you brought up stud finders, do you have any suggestions on how to use it? Well, there's two two main types. Like in the in the hardware store, we always carry the Zircon brand, mm -hmm. and they were great because they have inexpensive ones and they have heavier duty ones. They have some that will do, you know, through plaster. Some that are just designed for drywall. The inexpensive ones, they do a nice job. They're primarily designed to find the edges of the stud. Uh, you know, a couple things that people make a mistake with a stud finder is they'll depress it, the button that turns it on before they put it onto the wall. Mm -hmm. You have to not touch it put the stud finder on the wall, then you depress the button to turn it on, and then you slowly move it left and right till you find the edge of the stud. So it'll it'll have a light and also a sound. When you find one edge, then as you move over and it comes off the stud, you're basically finding the other edge of the stud, then it turns itself off and the light goes out. So you're finding the edges, you mark that, and now you measure to the center of that stud. 
What I always liked was a little more expensive stud finder. It's called the Franklin sensor, mm -hmm. and it does a great job because you can turn it on in the air. When you lay this on a sheet of drywall, it finds the complete stud underneath. So it has a whole bar of lights, mm -hmm. and so the lights will show exactly where the stud is. So usually studs on a wall are measured the center of that stud is 16 inches away from the center of the next stud in general when you get around doors or corners then they're closer and then it becomes difficult with a traditional stud finder to find the edge sometimes in corners mm -hmm. and what this franklin does it just does an excellent job of painting a picture of what's happening underneath the wall so you know again it's one of the other problems with a standard sensor like that zircon is if you act if you put it on the wall and you turn it on now and you're over a stud, right. then you'll be moving it left and right and you won't find anything. Mm -hmm. So then you need to kind of remember where you put that stud finder on the wall and then you want to move it over about six inches. You're going to release it, you're going to hold it against the wall, push the button again, and then you'll find a stud. So a problem with a lot of houses, you get cracks in the corners, right. like, like in the, between your ceiling and your wall or between the corners of walls. One of the best tricks i found is just using a painter's caulk so if it's a crack just running down a seam, instead of trying to get compound in there and the, the, the compound, if there's any movement there at all, that compound will crack and you're kind of building up a weird look in a corner. Mm -hmm. So I just always used, it's the easiest in corners, use a little painter's caulk. You can either use a squeeze tube or a caulk and a gun, gun it down and then use a cloth and your finger and just wipe it with your finger, then wipe your finger off with the cloth and just go back and forth making a bunch of passes till you force caulk into those cracks and then you have a super thin coat over it. And most of the latex caulks are slightly flexible, so they're going to allow it a little bit of movement. And painter's caulk, make sure you're looking at it. You wouldn't want 100% silicone. 100% silicone is sticky and terrible to try to smooth, and you can't paint it. Uh -huh. So you're looking for a painter's caulk that's paintable, and just wipe it in corners if you have a crack. The next type of hole is very easy for homeowners to repair themselves and learn how to do it. It's just small dents and small holes, maybe the size mm -hmm. of your finger. This lightweight compound, and, and when you grab these bottles, uh, I mean, if you go into the hardware store and you grab regular compound, no matter what the size, and grab a lightweight version mm -hmm. right next to it, it is shocking, the difference in weight. And so the stuff will float up into it. This is what I love about small holes in ceilings, too. This lightweight compound, will f you can float it in there with a compound knife. It stays in place. It doesn't shrink. Right. dries very quickly, and then you can hit it with a, a damp sponge and then get a second coat on there and really make it look nice. So, again, if you have a dent or a small hole, you know, just, again, use this lightweight compound and go after it uh, a couple times. Now, once we get into settling cracks and larger holes, we're going to start to use either some of these kits or compound and compound tape mm -hmm. and that's where you really need to take your time have patience and we're going to always be putting three thin coats on this and that's really the key to make it look professional and now rather than just using a six inch knife which every homeowner should have now we're going to have a second knife either 10 inches or 12 inches wide mm -hmm. a 12 inch wide blade does a much better job but for beginners it's a little harder to control now, if you have a settling crack in your wall or ceiling, we're going to use compound tape and then three thin coats of compound. How do you and know if you need to use uh, tape? So if you have just a gouge in your wall or a, a, a crack because of something hitting your drywall, we're just going to use lightweight compound and we're going to solve the problem very easily. If you have a crack that's developed because the house is settling and you can see it slowly work its way across, over time and let's say you've tried to repair it and it's come back you know that it's a settling crack and in this case we want to cover this with a tape if that ever moves again and cracks it'll actually crack underneath the tape right in most cases and so you can repair this and you're not going to see it reappear again so the key is and I like you can either get paper tape or you can get a mesh tape that has a adhesive backing on it mm -hmm. For homeowners, I really believe that just the paper tape is simpler. When I was starting all of my you know, rehabbing and remodeling these homes, 
I tried to use both to see which was better. I had a hard time with the mesh. As you pull it with the compound knives, and if you're, if you're not skilled, what happens is it slowly unravels, right. and so you have these little pieces of string almost that kind of stick out. And it was more difficult for me to work with. You'd have to cut it and make sure that none of the, the edges were fraying. With paper, you lay it down, you embed it, and you're done for the most part. So I think it's easier for homeowners. So the way I would recommend is, let's say that we're fixing a crack. You would take your six inch compound knife and you'd scrape all the way down it. Some guys will go use the edge of the knife and create like a little V in that crack so that there's a little more area for the compound to get in and grab, have a little more uh, mm-hmm. teeth in there. We're going to then put- So you made your crack look terrible? We made our crack look worse. Yes. So now we're going to take a a very thin amount of compound, about an eighth of an inch. And I like, again, for beginners, I like using just an all-purpose compound. You can use spackle, and we'll go over some of the different types uh, in in a few minutes here. But let's just say we're using all-purpose joint compound. It has a lot of moisture in it. It really grabs the tape very well. Is this lightweight compound? You can use lightweight or like the heavy body, Mm -hmm. but an all-purpose compound we're looking for. We're going to put a thin bead, probably three or four inches wide with our six-inch blade, and we're going to make it about an eighth of an inch, not very much on there, the whole length of the crack. And we're forcing it into the crack, and we're putting a thin coat over the top of it. We're taping, taking our tape, and if we have to cut it to an angle, let's say it's coming up at an angle, uh, we're going to cut it, we're going to embed it in it, and then we're taking that knife and we're pushing it hard into this compound, and we're pushing out all the excess. We're dragging it all the way down one direction, then dragging it all the way the other direction, and we want to be left with about a sixteenth of an inch worth of this compound underneath the tape. And then we're going to very lightly go over the whole tape and put a super thin coat of this compound over the tape. And we can make many passes until you don't see any knife marks. And we're trying to feather it out wide from a few inches on each side from the tape. And now we're just going to let that dry. And all-purpose compound, it takes quite a few hours. For most homeowners, I recommend just letting it dry 10 or 12 hours or just overnight. Right. And then what you're going to do the next day... I think day, that's the biggest mistake people make. They, they try to they go rush. after the the compound too soon, and you're either sanding it and it's still slightly wet, right. and you're, you're not solving your problem. Right. And if there's damp spots and you try to go over it with compound, you'll pull it up, you'll get bubbling. Right. So you're going to let that dry, let's just say overnight, so it's fully dry. And then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to lightly hit the whole area with our compound knife and just kind of scrape it so there's any high spots or any little knife marks. We're knocking those down. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to hit it with this damp sponge. Just lightly hit the whole length so it looks super smooth. Then we're going to put a very thin second coat on. And now with the second coat, we can use our 10-inch or 12-inch knife. And we're just going to go down the whole length. And we're spreading this out a few inches on each side wider than the first coat. Mm-hmm. And what this is going to do is we're slowly making this, this seam disappear. We're going to go over it a few times. Again, what's nice about all-purpose compound is you can make a few passes, a beginner, Mm -hmm. and not worry about it drying too quickly where it starts to, again, kind of bubble up. Uh, We're going to let this second coat dry overnight. We're going to do the same thing. Hit it with a compound knife just to hit any high parts off, any knife marks. We're going to take a damp sponge, wipe the whole thing. And now the key on this third coat is we're going to go completely wide. So let's say we have a 10-inch blade. I would use the edge of the blade just about the middle of the seam, Mm -hmm. and I'm spreading this eight or nine inches wide on one side, and then I'm going on the other side and making it eight or nine inches wide there. The trick is this seam and that tape is actually slightly higher than the rest of the wall, Right. but we're feathering this from those, you know, let's say 10 inches on one side, we're feathering it all the way up and over, and then feathering it off to the other side and to the eye, it's going to completely disappear. You will not see this seam. And that's it. That's the patience that most homeowners don't do. They don't take these three coats. It's time consuming, but you will look like a master. It will absolutely disappear. So I only slightly freaked out when you did this for the settling crack in my office right. that we did a video on. Because <laughs> right. I went from, you know, just a small little crack to this huge, 
uh, uh, area of drywall uh, uh, well, or, or I mean, of compound top, yeah. and, and tape. <laughs> that you still haven't painted. <laughs> That's going to be another episode. <laughs> yes, I know, but... And then the last thing you'd want to do is, is when you hit it with your damp sponge for the last time, if you need to hit it with some sp sandpaper, I like, I prefer uh, a sanding sponge. Right. So it has, you know, it's a sponge and it's, you can manipulate it and change the shape. You can do it wet or dry. I like, you know, a very fine and have a drop cloth down and just barely touch it if there's any high spots or any little imperfections where there's some divots or knife marks that you didn't like. And you can feather that out and just make it look beautiful. Another trick that you should use on all your compounding is if you have a flashlight or especially if you use a drop light with that big metal reflector and lay it against the wall you can really see any imperfections. So I would work that down the seam using that light hitting it very lightly because we don't want to stir up all this dust get it in the air it just becomes a mess now for a little bit bigger hole than your finger uh, let's say it's a couple inches big we can just use a small piece of compound tape get compound around the hole we're going to embed it into that and just basically do the same thing if you have a hole that's three to let's say six inches uh, DAP has a really nice uh, patch. It's called Presto Patch, mm -hmm. and we did a video on this. It's a round piece of drywall, so you're actually replacing a piece of drywall. Right. It's half-inch drywall, and it has a piece of a large piece of compound tape right over the top of mm -hmm. it. And so it comes with a uh, a little guide to so that you can make a a template a template exactly. Thank you to make a an outline for this. So you put the template over the hole, and they have two sizes. One is three and seven eighths, and one is six and seven eighths. And you put this template over the hole. You create a pencil mark, and then you take a drywall saw. You're going to knock out this size, and you're going to drop this piece of drywall right into it. And it <laughs> oh, does your a mom was does a freaking fancy. out when oh, we yeah, did this. Oh yeah, we did repair a her condo <laughs> and uh, in the closet. And it, I mean, it was a a big hole, but I mean, yeah, you, well, it's you, six you, inches <laughs> big. I mean, well, you made this hole bigger, right. and so she was freaking out. And we're like, hey, trying to do a video. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what are you doing, JC? <laughs> <laughs> so, but for for holes that are under six and seven eighths, uh, this thing does a really nice job because you're actually making it kind of structural. Right. So yeah. you're so you're getting compound around the edge of this piece of drywall, which kind of ties it to the existing drywall, and then this tape is hooked to it. So it does a, a very nice job. One thing I want to mention, when you're using a drywall saw, drywall saws do a nice job. Very easy to cut into drywall and notch out something like for this Presto patch. The one thing you got to be aware of is knowing where your electric is. And if you don't know, make sure you're only cutting as deep as the drywall. So you're mm -hmm. only going in a half an inch and you're just picking at this rather than you right. know going crazy. Because if, if you have Romex behind here, you, you don't want to hit it. Now, if you have a repair that needs a piece of drywall to fix that hole, we have to be very aware of where the studs or joists are, and then we need to be able to attach into it. So we're going to be using a stud finder again. Mm -hmm. Our studs, in most cases, there's going to be two by four. Let's say we're just repairing a wall. We have two by four studs, so they're actually only an inch and a half wide, and we need to find this. Which the doesn't make any sense. Right. <laughs> Right. Well, it's changed. It used to be actually two by four, but now they're saving money, so they're only an inch and a half <laughs> wide. So we need to find the center of it. So we need to measure out three quarters. We want to make sure that we're hitting the center of that stud with the edge of the drywall, and that's going to give us the most strength, and it's going to give the wall the most strength. So very easy to work with if you need to cut a place. So now we're going to measure it. I like using a drywall T or just a straight edge so that we can make nice straight marks with a, a pencil. In fact, we uh, we started using this really cool pencil blade. So it's a graphite blade that's shaped like a razor knife. Mm -hmm. And you can put it in a razor knife. It's called Accutrax. And we've used that a couple of times. So I keep that in my tool bag. And I pull it out like a knife. And so you can put a straight edge, take this, run this all the way along a uh, straight edge so that you get nice straight lines. We're going to cut out our section that we want to put a, float a piece of drywall in, and then we're going to cut our drywall. And to cut drywall is very easy. We're going to measure the shape we need. So we'll make a pencil mark. We'll use a straight edge. I love a drywall tee because it locks onto the edge. Right. Very easy to not only score with a razor knife, 
but to you know draw our pencil lines always use a super sharp knife because what happens is that paper will ball up mm -hmm. the paper on the face of the drywall so we have our shape we've measured it out we're going to take a sharp razor knife we're going to cut into the face rather than the back so you have a white really nice looking side and then the other side is almost brown looking right so you have a face and a back so we always cut through the face first and then we're going to grab both sides of the drywall, put our knee in the back of it, and hit it with our knee, and it's going to bend that. Again, if you watch our uh, YouTube channel, we have a, a couple of tips mm -hmm. on how to do that. But it bends very easy, and now we're going to take that razor knife on the back, and then we're going to snap it free. And now it's that easy to cut. It cracks very easy. That gypsum snaps very easy with a little bit of pressure. It's just cutting that face and the back with a razor knife. Then when we attach it to our studs, we're always going to use drywall screws. It's going to do a much better job. We're going to make sure that we dimple it. It has to be just slightly under the surface because we want to fill that with compound. How far apart are you placing these screws? So if you're on your ceiling, you want them about 12 inches apart. On walls, about 16 inches apart. And then the edges, you want about 3 eighths of an inch from the edge, otherwise it tears through the paper. And so we're screwing all this into the studs, and then we're going to use our compound tape. And just like we did a settling crack, we're going to first embed compound in between that seam so it kind of locks the drywall together. We're going to tape it, and then we're going to apply three coats of compound, feather it out, hit it lightly with a wet sponge, and it's very easy to make repair and drywall with a sheet of drywall. So what's the different types of compound that they can use? So for most of your repairs, the, you know, just the lightweight is great for simple repairs. If you're doing anything with tape, I like an all-purpose compound. It takes a little longer for it to dry, but it just does an excellent job. It, it's super smooth, the final top coat. It looks great. But if you look at the instructions on the package itself, you're going to see how quickly it dries. Like DAP has uh, something called Fast and Final. It's one to two hours. Mm -hmm. It does a really nice job. Sheetrock is a real big company that has all-purpose joint compound. I've always used their products, and they're about 12 hours, and I generally let those dry overnight. A lot of nice moisture in their, their regular compound. They're lightweight, dries a little bit quicker, but, uh, you know, again, for homeowners, I think it's, it's an excellent product. And when she we did that drywall video, uh, the settling crack in the office, uh, yes. didn't we use... I think it was DAP that had the uh, compound that started off pink. And then it, yeah, then it turns white when it's right. dry. Yeah, that does a really nice job, especially if you're not used to it and, and mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're just working on a lot of other projects around the house. When it's white, you know you can go after it with a second coat. So that's a nice product. And then I like Sheetrock's powdered setting type compound. If you want to, if you're doing bigger projects and you can mix what you need, mm -hmm. again it comes in a formula that dries in 20 minutes, 45 minutes, or 90 minutes. You'd have to use uh, you know, one of those mud pans. It's like a, a long oblong pan that you put your compound knife in and you're going to mix up your compound. Mm -hmm. But it dries quickly. It's, it's more for, you know, once you get a little more experience, it does a very nice job. What about spackle? So the original spackles were, I think, in the 1930s. It was actually a, a, a brand name. Mm -hmm. And then now it's just become kind of, you know, like Kleenex. <laughs> you know, it just means compound for the most part. Really read the packaging because mm -hmm. each product dries differently. Some of them don't have enough moisture. In it. Some of them aren't recommended to embed tape into. The one thing that I can share with you is take the time to read the packaging because it'll tell you whether it's good for, uh, you know, taping with compound mm -hmm. tape or just for fixing small divots and dents. Well, especially when you're standing in the aisle in that four-foot section, there's a lot of different It types. can almost be overwhelming. Right. But I would say the DAP products, you know, again, that's because what we've sold at the hardware mm -hmm. store and we've got the best results. And that's what I've used, DAP and Sheetrock. They, they do a very nice job. And they, it's very clear on the instructions what it's used for. So I think those are some good basic tips for patching drywall. And, you know, don't be scared. It's, once you get into it, it's fun. Mm -hmm. And you can really do a nice job, save a ton of money from hiring painters to come in and patch, uh, you know, small imperfections in your drywall. It's, it's very rewarding and easy to do. Rewarding? It is. <laughs> I find it very rewarding. I sit back and look at anything I fix I know. <laughs> and admire it. 
All right. Well, I think that wraps up this episode. If you would like to hear us every week, you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement Channel. You can subscribe to that as well. If you'd like to talk to us, you can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Thank <laughs> you.